timing got the end of the song here we are six o'clock monday night and we are on the second night of our peace or our joy theme i'm stuck on peace man i'm loving that but this is a good week for joy it's got a lot of good things going on and uh, our theme tonight is real interesting i think you're going to enjoy it uh, there's a story I could tell. I'm going to, I prayed about this before we started because it's hard for me to say it a lot of times and, and keep my composure because it was a interesting day when it went down. But uh, here we are, Monday night. I hope you had a good day. And the theme for Monday night is joy comes in the morning. So there's a song we do that one of the phrases in the song is joy comes in the morning. So let's just get at it, can we? Because this first song is one that is interesting, the way it starts out. It says, how long, Lord? It's from Psalms 13, it's verses 1 and 2 and 5 and 6. If you have a Bible app and you want to look at it, this is where we're at. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices. In your salvation, I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. So what comes to mind on this is I have a friend, it's an evangelist, and he has some intercessors that pray with him, but he's been witness to a lot of miracles. He prays with people and God answers prayers. And, and the, the thing about a miracle is a miracle happens Without any explanation, it happens in a lot of times in an instant. And the only explanation for it is it has to be God. 
A healing can take place over a period of time. It can take place through the hands of caregivers or through the other means that God puts in the place of things. But a miracle, there is absolutely no doubt God did this. One second you're this way and the next minute you're that way. So this lady that has been following their ministry, had been following their ministry for a long time. She had been prayed for for a certain ailment she had over the course of several, several years for 50 times. And each time that prayer was not answered yet in its fullness. So if you were that person, you know, and you didn't have the kind of faith that perseveres and builds character and builds hope, you would be screaming out probably these first two verses. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And you would leave it there. And a lot of times you would just leave it there and just say, it's not going to happen for me. But what's really cool about this lady is every time they prayed for her and every time it didn't happen, it built her faith. It built her character and it built her hope in that Jesus was going to do something great in this. She maintained her faith. She kept praying and these guys kept praying. And the more they prayed, the more her faith came. And on the 51st time, and this is like a decade later, God healed her completely, completely of the ailment she was having. I mean completely, right then, right there. So this is where she puts, I trust in your unfailing love. She carried that all those years. And then my heart rejoices in your salvation. Why does she do it? Because she's connected to the source. Even in the sorrow of it not happening right yet, she has the faith, the hope, and the joy in the salvation she knows that just as I was talking about my friend who went on to be with Jesus last a week or two ago, he knew no matter what happened, the joy he had was knowing that healing was coming. And she knew that there was something big going to happen in her healing situation. And the Lord healed her completely. John 1 16 says of your fullness, we receive and faith and grace upon grace. And man, she received it and the grace was just spilling out and the joy was just overflowing. If you were with us last night, this would be that geyser that's squirting 180 feet up in the air and it's a kaleidoscope of colors because she was so excited for what God had done for her. So that's what comes to mind in this is, is you know, we can be disappointed but our joy should maintain, our joy should be in the trust we have in our Jesus and in the salvation we have in knowing that he's hearing us. And maybe there's a reason for just not quite yet. You know, in our life, we have a prayer that we're doing just like that. And the Lord always tells us how to pray and how to pray for more. And we just maintain the faith because we know that this answer is coming. And he's going to do great things with it. And we hold on to John 1, 16 of his fullness we receive in grace upon grace. So let's look at this reading tonight. It starts with when 11-year-old Riley moves across the country to San Francisco. Her world is thrown for a loop. So are the five core emotions inside the headquarters of her brain. Joy, sadness, anger fear and disgust. If you've seen the Disney movie Inside Out, you know these colorful characters are the ones who run the control panels of the girls' actions, experiences, and memories. Not seen it. I have a shirt from it, but I haven't seen it. Spoiler alert, after a meltdown in emotional headquarters, Riley's world is in upheaval. But there's a touching scene at the end when Joy hands over the controls of the emotional console to sadness. 
Sadness is able to let Riley cry and let all the bad feelings, let out all the bad feelings. As her parents support and hug her, Riley cries and smiles contently at the same time. And sadness and joy hold hands and form a new memory together. Here's what I can tell you. When we finally hear Jesus' call and we finally let all the struggles of life, which include every single emotion that this movie is portraying, there is that moment where our emotions overtake us. And nine times out of ten, we have this emotional breakdown, emotional breakthrough, where there are tears and we let all of that out. Let me tell you, that is a good thing. I'm not too manly to say that I've had that moment more than once. And it's a good thing when I can come to Jesus and say, look, I've made mistakes. I've done things not the way it was supposed to be. And I just want to ask you to take that from me and help me through it and not to ever do that again. Help me be a better father, a better husband, a better pastor, a better preacher, a better leader, whatever the case may be. But help me through that. And there's this recognition that without Jesus, I can't do it on my own. And even if I have Jesus, I need more Jesus. You know, I, I'm, on, I'm in a meeting today and we're all praying out the same thing. We want more. And that's the truth. We, we need more because we need more to be able to make it through these things that come up in our life so that we can function at the highest that he wants us to function at. And when we do that, you know, just like her parents are there supporting and hugging her, it's this whole thing with Jesus that we were talking about in the scriptures a couple days ago, putting his arm around us, come to me all you who are weary, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, your emotions are there, you're struggling with things of life, you don't know how to get through these things, you know, depression, anger, sadness, uh, anxiety, and he wants to put his arm around you. He wants to support you and hug you. And he puts it around you. That's his yoke. And he wants to just sit there and love on you. And give you this moment where he takes all that junk out of our life. And he holds hands with you. And all of a sudden, when that stuff is relieved of you, that sadness moment is holding hands with a joyful moment. And you can just feel the shift. You know, we talk about a momentum swing in sports a lot of times. Well, that's a momentum swing in our spiritual life. When we finally get it, and that sadness turns to joy. Because we finally let it all out. We finally repented of it. We finally just said, Lord, this is my situation. It's not like he doesn't know, but he's waiting for us to just confess it and say, hey, this is where I'm at. He's like, yeah, I get it, but I needed you to just come and hold hands with me so I can pull you through it. Sadness and joy are often the same for us. Life is hard and pain is real, even in this joyous Christmas season. Rather than putting on a fake smile or trying to power our way to happiness, it's important to express our hurts and sorrows. And that takes me back to a day. And I'm going to try this. <clears throat> I came home after a shift on the helicopter. And I, it, we worked 24-hour shifts. And I met my wife at the door. She always met me at the door. And I met her at the door. And she must have saw my fake smile. 
because I was holding in a bunch of hurts. She asked me immediately, honey, what's wrong? And I told her I'd been a, a flight medic now for roughly 12 years. And she, I said, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And it wasn't the hours. It wasn't the job, so to speak, because I love being able to help people. But it was the stressors of what I was doing because that shift was the first shift in my whole career ever, then and after, where everybody died. And what made it more difficult was it started with an 18 month old baby went to a man that was post cardiac arrest and we only had an eight minute flight and he had been resuscitated and all we had to do was maintain him. But as we were only a few minutes out, he went down again and we couldn't get him back. And in my whole career, I'd never had anybody die on me. They, were, they had either expired before I got to him or they expired after I left him. And then what capped it off was a scene flight we had where a 15-year-old had expired in his vehicle. And we, I had to do a surgical procedure for an airway. So all that stuff combined, and you, you said, well, that's only three calls, but all three of them were major critical. And it takes us quite a long time to process paperwork in between flights. So it's like you just finish one, you're going on another one. And that really hit me because some things that I'd never had to deal with, I had to deal with. And so when I went home, there was some significance to the young baby because I had a little girl at the time. And I just, I just didn't know. And my wife said these words to me, because this is where sadness and joy held hands. She said to me, first, she gave me that comfort. Honey, remember, they're only going to call you if it's serious now see in an ambulance you can have a serious call and then you can get some that are you know really don't have any seriousness to them at all so if they're only going to call you when it's serious now these things could happen and that's why they call you guys because they only want the best for those calls and those families are thankful that they, that you guys were there. And God's going to use this for his glory. And as I shed those tears, I also felt the Lord's touch and the joy came back because it's like, yeah, that's right. That's why we do it. Yeah, so if they had a chance, we gave them every chance we could. Yeah, you're right. And the Lord's going to use this, and he's used that since in, in different services we've held other places for youth and for different people and for different agencies somewhere. We've used that service. I've talked about in more detail that 24-hour shift. And the Lord has really used that day <clears throat> to help me make a difference in what really happens when we need to be ready. And so sadness and joy met that moment. 
And I really got the idea of what Jesus was talking about. But here again, it was that moment where I had to let it all out. I couldn't hide behind a fake smile and try to power my way through happiness. And I really believe that I needed to have that person to speak to and remind me that God uses that for his glory. Not, not the deaths, but the fact that he's using what I do for a living at that time for his glory. And he's helped me use it in other services somewhere. So when we go through these times and we're thinking, how long, Lord, how long are you going to forget me? How long are you going to hide your face? What we need to do is look in the silver lining of things and try to find what are the little blessings God has blessed me with right now that even though I'm not receiving all that is to be received, what are the small things he's blessing me with right at the moment that show me his hand is still in it? Because if we keep reading, it says, God wants us to pour out our hearts to him. So if we're pouring out our hearts to him, then here's what happens. Like I poured out my heart to my wife, and then God starts reminding me on what he's doing in my life and what he's done in my life and what he's going to do for me in my life. The psalmist gives us a great example in this prayerful song, in his songs and poems. When we are willing to cry out, where are you, God, and allow him to hold and support us, he can fill us with comfort and strength to choose joy and experience his presence. What's that mean? That means by sharing in that particular moment, see, I'm talking about joy again and I'm getting off. I don't want to sit still, man. It just excites me right now. I'd be running up and down my church if I was on the other camera. But it gives us a choice to choose joy and experience his presence. See, if I didn't share that, that stuff, my tendency is when things eat me up is to shut down and I don't think I'm alone in that I think a lot of us when when our circumstances overwhelm us we shut down we have different ways of shutting down some of us don't talk some of us will go into seclusion and you know sit somewhere and just be on our own and not really socialize with anybody and there's people all around us but we sit in our own little corner some of us go in our rooms and don't deal with anybody and everybody else is doing things and you know we decide we're not going to be a part of that by our own decision because we're harboring that stuff and that's how the enemy has a stronghold the enemy satan the devil that's how he keeps a stronghold on us and makes us feel that we aren't deserving of his joy. Again, I take you to John 10.10. 10. The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal any good favor you might think you have and kill any thought process you have that says you're worthy so he can destroy any kind of joy that has any ability of surfacing because you allow the presence of the Holy Spirit to be in your life by sharing this with God. But the backside of that same verse is, which this is Jesus speaking, says, but I, come to me, I, if you just come to me first, give you life abundantly. What's abundantly? Life abundantly that's full of joy. We sang this yesterday. Unspeakable. Unspeakable joy. But man, if we just harbor that stuff and we never have that moment where we can just let it all out, <laughs> then what do we do? We shut down. I'm willing to cry it out, man. I had this moment. We were on sabbatical. 
and I'm in this church. We visited a whole bunch of church on, uh, churches on sabbatical. And I'm in this church in Indy, which we were potentially maybe going to go to and be uh, an associate. And I'm in this church, man, and I'm worshiping, and, and God's really talking to me, man. And he is telling me, you've kind of put things, I don't really think he said kind of. He said, you put things in the wrong order. I appreciate the fact that you have me first, but you put the church second and made your family suffer. And while I love that you think the church is important and you really do a hard job of working for the church, you can't make your family suffer. If you're going to be perfect love in the eyes of Jesus, they need to see that first. And you have to put your family above the church and quit ignoring and being gone and not being in your family's life. You have to put your family second. You need to repent of that. Not just to me, but to your family. And I'm standing there praising him. And his tears are running down my eyes. And I'm saying, Lord, thank you for this awakening. Thank you, Lord, for helping me see that. Thank you, Lord, for just making me understand. And so we go back to this hotel we're at. And I said, family meeting, family meeting. And I had all my family in there that was living at home at the time. And I told them, I said, I have to repent. I have put things in the wrong order. This is what the Lord told me. And I repented to them. And I had that cry out moment with my family. But the joy that came from it was overwhelming. Not just with me, but with my family. And I made it a choice that day to let his presence be there. To let his presence bring in the joy. To let his presence change the way my family saw me. And I've worked hard ever since to let them see, no, this is what Jesus is really about. And I'm hoping today that it makes a better difference in them. So it's important if we're willing to cry out, where are you, God? And allow him to hold and support us. He can fill us with comfort and strength so we can choose joy. And experience his presence. As King David put it in Psalms 30 verse 5. Weeping may stay for the night. But rejoicing. Remember we talked about rejoicing. The return of. Coming back to. Rejoicing comes in the morning. So the joy comes back. I don't know about you, but I have a whole lot more fun being joyful than being in misery because I'm holding something in. So what in sadness or pain do you need to express to find support? And how can you create your own personal psalm to pour out your heart to God? And a psalm is a song or a poem. You know, a lot of people do well writing. All you got to do is look on a social network. <laughs> or an email or a text. People will say anything in those things. So if you're struggling with something, maybe just start writing. And write it out. And just write out, Lord, and whatever you need. And whatever's causing you pain or sadness. But as you write, be willing to choose to allow his presence into your life and receive joy. Remember John 1.16 Of your fullness, we receive. 
and grace upon grace, fullness of joy. Write it out and be willing. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us, understanding us, and then be willing to take us by the hand and come into our presence with your presence. Comfort us and give us a new heart, Lord. I love how Ezekiel writes, how it's written in Ezekiel 33, Lord, that you can take out our stony hearts and replace them with soft, moldable, obedient hearts, Lord. I'm thankful for the day, Lord, that you took out my stony heart. Helped me to see with a soft, moldable heart, Lord, that I don't have to feel that way. That with you, we can accomplish anything. And that we can be the representation of you that you really want us to be. And not blame it on others, not let others dictate our eternity, but just choose, Lord, the joy of the Lord and let it be what drives us and let it be what makes us who we are. Bless us tonight, Lord, and help us to let you in and help us to choose joy this Christmas season. And Lord, if we write it and we can write it better, help us to write it with an open heart so that your presence can just come into our presence and help us make a difference. We thank you, Lord, for all you do. We thank you for these nights at six o'clock and we praise you, Jesus, <laughs> for all you do for us. We love you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us again tonight. We'll see you tomorrow with some special guests who really will be fun to have with us. Have a good evening. Enjoy your dinner.